Story recapped here. Today, I'm going to explain an action, sci-fi, and thriller film called In Time. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. In the future, humans have been genetically modified to stop aging at 25. The only caveat is when humans get to age 25, they only have one year left to live. A person's life is shown on their forearm with a timer, and time is now the world's currency. The rich can basically live forever, while the poor live their lives paycheck to paycheck, literally. Will wakes up and sees he has less than 24 hours left. He heads down and greets his mother, Rachel, who is celebrating her 50th birthday. Their celebration is cut short when they start talking about finances. Rachel says she has three days left on her time and reminds Will of bills and loans they need to pay. Will reassures her that he'll come up with the money. Rachel says she'll be away for two days working and she'll pay a loan. She tells Will he has to meet with her at a bus station so he can give her more time. She then hands Will 30 minutes so he can pay for a decent lunch. Will kisses her goodbye before heading to work. On his way to work, Will runs into a kid, Maya. She asks for a minute and Will happily gives her five minutes and sends her away smiling. He arrives at work and meets with his friend Borel. Will works at a factory making time storage devices. After a hard day's work, he clocks out and gets paid. He sees that his payment is lacking and demands more, but the distributor says the quota has increased and Will didn't reach it. Will later meets heads to a local bar and some men invite him to gamble but he turns him down, but not after reminding one of the men he owes Will an hour. Will takes the hour and meets with Borel. Borel is drunk, pointing to someone who's been buying drinks for everyone. He says the man has over a century in his time. Will spots someone eyeing the man, and he decides to inform the man, Henry, that somebody is watching him. Will tells the man to leave as he's attracting too much attention, but the man refuses. A group of men enters and everyone at the bar is suddenly rushing out. Borel tells Will that they're Minutemen, gangsters who rob and extort. Borel pulls Will away, but Will intends to stay and watch. He assures Borel that he wouldn't do anything stupid, and Borel leaves him. The leader, Fortis, tells Henry he wants his time and even offers Henry the chance to fight for it. Henry appears nauseous and heads to the bathroom. He vomits while a Minuteman keeps watches. Will suddenly bursts in, knocks the guy out, and takes Henry with him. Will and Henry run out in Fortis and his men chase after them. They manage to escape after climbing over a gate and hiding inside an abandoned building. The Minutemen are close behind and almost find them, but eventually give up their chase when one of the men tells Fortis that he recognized Will. Will and Henry get acquainted, and Henry reveals he's 105 years old. He says his mind is fatigued, and he desires death, explaining his rash behavior. Will gets mad, considering that he and his mother have to work several jobs just to live another day. Henry then reveals the secrets of their horrific world. Rich people increase the cost of living so that poor people keep dying, and, in turn, more time goes to the rich. The reality is that there is more than enough time for everyone. However, greed and lust for immortality blind the rich and powerful. Henry asks Will what he'll do if he had the same amount of time as him. Will answers that if he has that time, he will not waste it like Henry. Henry thinks about what Will says, and the two get rest. Morning comes, and Henry decides to give all but five minutes of his time to a sleeping Will. After a while, Will wakes up and discovers he is over a century in his time. He looks for Henry and sees him sitting atop a bridge. As Henry's final seconds count down, and he smiles falls into the river. Later, Will heads to Borel and sees Borel's wife, Greta, holding their newborn baby. Will asks for Borel, and he reveals to him the time he has. Will talks about the events of the night before, and Borel asks what he plans to do. Now that he has learned the truth, Will intends to bring justice. Before leaving, Will gives Borel. With his fortune, Borel eyes the bar on the other side of the street. Meanwhile, Rachel pays a loan of two days and attempts to ride the bus but finds that she can't afford the fare as the prices have gone up. She pleads to the driver and the passengers, but everyone looks away. Feeling desperate, she starts running. The two are in a race against time, and with every second and every step, death draws closer for Rachel. Finally, they see each other. They run as fast as they can, but death beats Rachel and Will. A lifeless Rachel falls into Will's arms. Will weeps, knowing they were mere seconds away from living the life they've always wanted. Will now has all the time he's ever wanted, but his mother has none. The following day, timekeepers retrieve Henry's body from the river. Raymond, the senior timekeeper, and Jaeger, his junior, investigate the scene. As they're about to leave, Raymond sees a camera on top of the bridge. Meanwhile, Will sits inside a car wearing a new suit and a new look on his face. They leave the time zone, a border that separates the different social classes. On his trip, they pass multiple borders, paying a toll fee that increases with each one. The last border costs Will a year, and the driver welcomes him to the city of New Greenwich. The driver asks Will what his true intentions are for coming to New Greenwich, and Will answers he wants to make the people of New Greenwich pay. The city is entirely different from what Will is used to. As he exits the car, he immediately starts running, still used to living with little time. He looks at his arm and starts acting more like a person who is all the time in the world. However, he already caught the attention of a woman named Sylvia. Will enters a hotel and asks for a suite. In his luxurious room, Will wakes up still with 105 years. 
Even though he lies down in the comfiest of beds in a room with the best view, the untimely death of his mom still haunts him. For the first time in his life, he experiences gourmet food and drinks. He pays for his meal and tips the waitress a week. The waitress notices that Will doesn't act like everyone else, saying he does everything a little too fast. Will cheekily replies that he doesn't finish fast in the things that matter. Will plans to enter the casino, but first, he has to have a wardrobe change. In the timekeeper's headquarters, they see Will in the surveillance footage. Jaeger reports that a man crossed numerous borders going to New Greenwich. They gather more information about Will on the computer, and Raymond states that he knows Will's father. Will enters a casino and sits at a poker table. As the dealer deals, Philippe, a billionaire with eons in his time, acquaints himself with Will. Will's winnings after a few rounds of poker amounts to over two centuries. Philippe increases the pot by 50 years. Despite this, Will calls with total confidence, and the river turns out to be the Six of Diamonds. Will's focus shifts from the game to the lovely dame, Sylvia, who sits beside Philippe. Philippe rolls up his sleeves, revealing almost 10 millennia's worth of time. He then talks about the immeasurable gap between the poor and the rich, justifying it as natural selection. He raises two more centuries. Will bites and calls, leaving his arm with a mere 30 seconds left. The outcome favors Will, and he receives a millennium. This brought a thrill to Philippe's dull life. He notices Will looking at Sylvia and asks if he thinks she's his grandmother, mother, or wife. Will simply says that she's beautiful. Philippe introduces her as his daughter, and she invites him to a party. The next day, Will purchases a brand new car with his winnings which he drives to Philippe's mansion. There he's introduced to three generations of women that look as if they're sisters. Will looks out of place among the high-class crowd. Sylvia approaches and saves him from a lonely night. They get to know more about one another, and their conversation leads them to the dance floor. She asks him if he comes from the ghetto, but Will neither admits nor denies her claims. Sylvia opens up to him about her meaningless life and how the time that she is shackles her when it's supposed to grant her freedom. While this is happening, Philippe and her wife stare at the two with watchful eyes, causing Will to lead Sylvia outside to the beach. Will and Sylvia undress and dives into the waters. They float on the ocean, naked and inches apart, with the moonlight glowing on their arms. Sylvia distances herself, but the waves push her closer to him. Suddenly, someone calls out from the shore, disrupting the romantic moment. They return, and Philippe asks Will to join him for a game of poker. However, the timekeepers barge in and confront Will. They sit him in an office, and Raymond introduces himself. He asks him why he's in New Greenwich and how he has over a millennium's worth of time. Will answers honestly and says that Henry gave it to him, committing suicide in the process. Raymond doubts his explanation, confiscates his time, and arrests him. As he leaves, Will asks him why he investigates suicide when murders happen in the ghetto every day. Raymond is astounded by his statement as it reminds him of Will's father. Will then attacks the timekeepers guarding him and rushes out to hold Sylvia hostage. They enter through the kitchen, and the two drive off on his car. A car chase occurs, and Raymond rams Will's car, causing them to lose control. Will expertly maneuvers while in reverse, barely dodging an incoming truck. They lose the timekeepers and hide underneath a bridge. Will asks for Sylvie's time, but she refuses. Morning comes, and they drive along the highways and run over traffic spikes. The tire punctures, and they crash. Fortis and his men approach the unconscious couple. He siphons time from Sylvia, but they leave in a hurry, leaving her with 30 minutes. Will gives her a few minutes, and they run off to get more time. With three minutes left, Will knocks on Borel's door. Greta answers and informs Will that Borel has died due to alcohol poisoning. Sylvia is in distress as she only has a handful of minutes left. Will notices her earring, and they rush to the jewelry dealer. Seeing that they're desperate, he underpays them and offers only two days. Will accepts, and they immediately hide as they hear the timekeeper's sirens. They walk through the city, talking about Sylvia's family business. Will asks how much they're worth, and she replies it's too much to the point that knowing it won't matter. Will calls Raymond and asks for Philippe to transfer a thousand years to the ghetto city in exchange for Sylvia. Raymond warns him that if he continues, he'll end up dead like his father. Will says his father died fighting someone, but Raymond says Will's father was doing something more dangerous. Night arrives, and Sylvia makes herself at home at Will's apartment. She asks about his family, and Will opens up about her mother's passing. He reminisces about his father and how he was a gambler like him but on a different game. His father would play a game akin to gambling, but using his time. His father won a lot, but his acts of generosity caused his death. They find out they're around the same age, and their bond grows stronger as they share more about each other's past. Morning comes, and he observes if Philippe holds up his end of the deal. Will sees no time transfers, leaving Sylvia disappointed with her father. Despite not receiving the time, Will still intends to let Sylvia go. He escorts her to the phone booth, giving her a gun as a farewell gift, and she returns the favor with a kiss. She calls her father and berates him for not delivering what Will wants. As they talk, Will is behind her, oblivious of Raymond pointing a gun at him. Sylvia turns and sees Raymond, and without hesitation, she shoots him. Will points a gun at a bleeding Raymond, but instead of taking his time, he gives some to Raymond, and the two drive off using his car. The two are parked on the side of the main road, and Sylvia asks if he has any plans. Since they're in a cop car, they play the part of a timekeeper, blocking an unfortunate driver. Sylvia gets too comfortable with the gun and fires a shot, scaring Will and the driver. 
they steal from the passenger and leaves with the new vehicle. Later that day, the two sit in the back seat and watch the news about them. Will states that she can still return to her father, but Sylvia doesn't want to return to her boring life. Will leans in for another kiss, now having time to do more than just that. In his office, Philippe talks to his partners and assures them that he didn't pay the ransom. They doubt his capabilities to resolve this issue, but Raymond enters the room before Philippe gets a chance to explain himself. He tells Philippe about her daughter not wanting to be rescued. Philippe apologizes and attributes his daughter's stubbornness to Stockholm Syndrome. Raymond does not budge and informs him that he plans to arrest his daughter. Philippe tries to bribe him with his time, but Raymond remains uninterested and leaves. The next day, Will teaches Sylvia how to shoot a gun properly. They talk about Will's plan to give time to the people, and she says that she can help him get the time he needs. At the local loaning establishment, a truck suddenly crashes through the glass panes. The two pull off a heist, stealing as much time storing devices as they can. They encourage the borrowers to get as much time as they want, and they all come rushing in. Later that day, Will gives time to Greta, Maya, and even the timeline distributor who gives people time as charity. Fortis continues to harass and kill people for time. He then sees on display a reward for 10 years for the capture of Will and Sylvia. Meanwhile, Philippe watches the news about his daughter's continuous pursuits to steal from him. Later that night, Raymond and the timekeeper surround a motel where the two stay in. Will and Sylvia notice they're surrounded, so they jump out the window to escape. Raymond chases after them through the streets and the dark alleyways. They make their way up the roofs, and a shootout commences. They manage to board a bus, losing Raymond. Fortis continues his search for Will and Sylvia. He interrogates a group, threatening to steal their time. When one dies, a man steps up and says he has information about their whereabouts. At the motel, the two sit on the couch together, talking about the challenges they're about to face. They both accept that if they get caught, they will die. At the period they've spent together, and at every time they almost died, Sylvia felt more alive than ever. Suddenly, the door gets knocked down by Fortis and his men. Feeling generous, Fortis gives Will a chance to play for his life. Fortis rolls up his sleeve for a game of strongarm, and Will accepts his challenge. Will struggles up to his final seconds, then, he turns it around when Fortis loses focus. His subordinates approach the table, and the fear in his eyes grows. Will grabs a gun from his ankle and shoots everyone while siphoning Fortis dry. Will and Sylvia stand on a rooftop, observing how prices keep rising. Will feels hopeless, saying that the rich will just increase the cost of living every time they steal. He says that only a million years will make a difference. Sylvia agrees, but she has a plan in mind. The next day, Philippe enters a building with a plethora of bodyguards surrounding him. Sylvia catches their attention and asks for this father. Among the guards is Will, who points a gun directly at Philippe's head. He commands the guards to put their weapons down, and they take Philippe hostage. In his office is a time vault, and in there sits a device with a million years. Philippe tries to explain that society will fail if that time falls to the wrong hands. He says that there will always be someone willing to sacrifice people for a shot at immortality. Will cannot contain his anger and points a gun at him, but he recoups his calmness. Will tells Philippe that immortality is not worth the life of even a single individual. The two then leave. Meanwhile, police vehicles start to barricade the main road. The timekeepers shoot at Will and Sylvia's car, but they miraculously get through unharmed, ramming the toll booth to cross the border. Raymond doesn't give up and chases after them. They arrive at the ghetto, and as they're about to reach safety, Raymond intercepts and crashes into them. Will exits unscathed and asks Maya to distribute the one million years. Raymond points a gun at the two, but the clamoring crowd blocks his line of sight, allowing for them to escape. Raymond hijacks a car, and the chase continues. Finally, they clash in the middle of the road. Raymond admits that he's also from the ghetto, and as he learned how to escape from poverty, his eyes were also open to the hard truth that the gap between the rich and the poor has to be maintained. As they talk, Raymond realizes that his time is up. He dies on the spot, and the two try to find a way to replenish theirs. In the distance is Raymond's car, they run towards it with seconds on their clock. Will gets there first and receives his time. He then runs to Sylvie who has seconds left. The two run into each other's arms in the nick of time, and the two get to live for another day. Citizens are now crossing borders into more expensive zones. The Minutemen watch on as their societal hierarchy begins collapsing. Sylvie and Will continue their routine, this time making their way to a massive time bank. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.